So Thank you, Martin. James. And James will join us just uh, from the big hall. Glad to have you. And won't you join me up here? So, how did you feel? Was your address received? Well, I saw quite a few nodding heads mm. uh, ar around the room, so maybe that's a good sign. It is indeed a good <laughs> sign, especially when it comes to the colder part of Europe, where the best emotion you can get is that not too bad means ultimate <laughs> of applause from that's the good. audience. That's good. Well, they, they did clap their hands, so that, that was good. But let's get down a little bit to the subject of your discussion. We have all recognized the indicators around the world that right. most majority of social economic indicators remain either flat or they are in decline or in some degree of growth. However, during the last 10, 15 years, we have seen one sector with an exponential growth. This is digital sector. And for many regulators, policymakers, entrepreneurs, the question is how to capture the growth of digital into the growth of social, economic and broader values. We haven't seen really any country who has enjoyed the digital growth being transformed into a similar economic growth. No. Why is that? Well, well I, I think p part of the answer lies in the fact that, and this is a little bit of what I, what I described, I don't know if you could actually see some of the slides that I actually used in the session. Uh, I don't know if they were broadcast or not, but even though we see digital technologies everywhere, in our pockets, in our homes, and everywhere, uh, the degree of digitization into economic sectors is actually relatively slow. So yes, the tech industry is highly digitized. Yes, media is highly digitized. Yes, increasingly financial services are highly digitized. But those are not very large sectors in terms of share of GDP or share of employment. If you look at the very large sectors, uh, which tend to be things like retail, all of it, uh, sectors like construction, sectors like manufacturing, not just the advanced manufacturing, but all of kind of the basic manufacturing. And if you look at sectors like healthcare and education, those are some of the largest sectors, and the extent to which they're digitized is relatively low. Now, the reason why that matters is because those sectors tend to be large, tend to be low productivity, and so at some level, it's not surprising that uh, we haven't seen, you know, productivity go up yet because we really haven't digitized the largest sectors. If you look at the last round of this, uh, back in the late 90s, when I think most economies were seeing productivity growth, and we finally thought we had resolved the so-called solo paradox, uh, what really happened then was uh, that paradox was only resolved. This is the paradox where Bob Solo, the Nobel laureate economist, said, why is it that we see computers everywhere except in the productivity numbers was the kind of the paradox. So that paradox seemed to have been resolved in the late 90s. But if you examine what actually happened, and I had the good fortune of working Bob Solo looking at this, it was only when the very large sectors started to change their business processes and transform themselves to take advantage of those computer systems back in those days that you then suddenly saw that start to impact the productivity numbers. We've barely touched that yet. So the large sectors have not started yet. Not really. So what is keeping them? Does, it, does, it, does the digital process evolve so quickly that nobody is able to capture what to do next? Because in, in nine months, you have a new generation, a new paradigm in terms of technology. Nobody knows what to do really to capture the opportunity. Well, Why, I, I what is yeah. holding them back? Well, I think it's several things. Uh, some of those sectors, by the way, are relatively profitable without it. Uh, so think about oil and gas and so forth. Uh, you know, they've, they've had a big commodity boom, so the pressure to digitize has not been at the top of the list. But with many other sectors like retail, those are very large but very fragmented sectors. So in retail is a good example because we can all imagine Amazon as being spectacularly digitized, but Amazon is such a small piece of the much, 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 much larger retail sector, which also includes a lot of small uh, retailers, small merchandisers. So the scale and fragmentation uh, makes it hard. The other part is that uh, it's again a lesson from the late 90s, which is that until you actually change the business processes and the processes in, in how those companies and sectors run, 
it's hard to get the benefits. That's why I'm excited that Europe in particular is encouraging Industry 4.0, because in some regards, if you look underneath that language, a lot of it involves changing business processes and trying to use these technologies across these more traditional and large sectors. That really hasn't happened yet. So digitization may have just happened in your pocket in, in mm. these things we carry around, but not so much in the large sectors of the economy. Is there a role for government to do something? How should governments respond to the automation, digitalization, which is taking place in front of our eyes right now? Well, I think from, so, so uh, as I suggested in the session earlier, I think there's two areas of action. Uh, one, the first was just how to capture the digital opportunity, and that has to do with, just quite frankly, uh, part of it is that the government itself needs to get much more digital. So governments now in the public sector are such a big portion of economies now, whether it's through what they do in terms of healthcare or governance or e-government or et cetera. So the government itself could set itself ambitious goals to digitize its own activities. And quite frankly, you know, Estonia has done it, but quite frankly, citizens and others would actually benefit from that. So there's a whole set of things that the government can do to itself. Then there's also the fact that government can create an environment that makes it easy for entrepreneurs and other companies to take advantage of digitization. I think, I, I think it's a missed opportunity that Europe, with its size and scale, still hasn't quite created mm. this thing called the single market yet. Uh, I think you're inching towards it, but it hasn't quite happened. That's such a missed opportunity, I think. So there's a set of things to do with enabling the digital economy. I think there's a separate conversation we should have at some point about what this means for people and work and so forth, which is a slightly different conversation. When you're working with different governments and observing their activities, do you see that governments really deal with, are they aware about the opportunities around the digital single market, for example? Why is it taking so much time? Why is it taking so much time? Well, I often feel, and I've had the fortune, good fortune of being involved in these activities, you know, both in the US government, but also to some extent here, it, it, it often feels like a, the governments have one half of what should be a two-part conversation. So the conversation that they have, and rightfully so, is in fact concern about uh, security, data privacy, uh, and all of those things. Those are very, very important, and I think that's the right conversation to have. But we never seem to quite get to the second part. Uh, which we should be having in parallel. And the second part is much more about enabling, about embracing these technologies, about encouraging, about investing in digital infrastructure, investing in skills, making it easy for entrepreneurs, and making it easy for uh, European companies to grow up to become large-scale digital innovators. So that part, which has to do with embracing the opportunity, we never quite seem to have it. Uh, all the conversations taken up by the first conversation, which is important, but it's only one part of a two-part conversation European governments should be having. Thank you, James, so much. Thank you for joining us, and we uh, need to get not only just a shakeful hand, but also a big hand well, compared you. to the other hall. Thank you once again. Thank you.